Gentle lady viewers and gentlemen viewers, good evening and welcome to our historical sketches show. This episode is the, is the second part of the sketch referring to the adventurers. We could almost say rocambolesque, the rocambolesque flight of Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte after having been defeated at the epic, epic Battle of Waterloo on June 19th, 1815. We are actually close to the bicentenary of that, of that epochal event. In the, previous, in the previous episode, we have left the small circle of Napoleon and his close associates in the little town of Berio Buck, where they, they decided that Napoleon would go to Paris, present himself to the assembly and declare himself ready, ready to defend the city against the allied forces of England and of Prussia using what remained of the army after the Battle of Waterloo. Now, in this little town, Napoleon and his entourage had breakfast, after which they moved to another historic town, the town of Laon, of which you see again here another beautiful cathedral. In Laon, Napoleon was recognized and the people shouted Vive l'Empereur! And the peasant, the peasants surrounding the little little train of Napoleon, offer themselves to defend him, to defend him to their death. From Laon, Napoleon proceeded towards Paris, as you can follow on the map here. And in the meantime, in the meantime, the little group that surrounded Napoleon and actually Napoleon himself came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was for Napoleon to resign and to go to the United States. His Majesty says Gorgo pro pro proposed to me to go with him and I accepted, accepted immediately. Finally, Napoleon reached Paris, went to the Elysee, which is, as you know, the equivalent of the capital in Washington, but there was received somewhat coldly. But still, in the streets, there were hordes, there were herds, there were hordes of people who were saying, shouting, Vive l'Empereur! Hail to the Emperor! At this point, uncertain, uncertain about just everything, except for the idea of going to America, Napoleon, Napoleon and company decided to go to the castle of Malmaison near Paris and wait there for the passports, for the passports for the United States. Now, the castle of Malmaison belonged to Napoleon's first wife, Josephine Bouarnais, who, however, at that point was not, was not at the castle. She was absent. But instead, who was there was the young Princess Hortense, her daughter. And here there are so many characters, so many characters floating around during and after the French Revolution that it is, it is almost impo it is impossible to keep them all, all in mind. However, Princess Hortense, which would be Napoleon's stepdaughter, is worth, is worth at least a few words. She was, she was as you can probably see even here in this portrait, she was of incomparable beauty and she married the emperor's younger brother and thus she became the daughter and the sister-in-law to her mother. Anyway, doesn't matter. Hortense had the three sons including including the future Napoleon III. And in the, in the 19th century, she led a number of salons to which thronged, to which thronged the, intelligentsia, the intelligentsia of the day. It is said that many men were unable to resist her charms, not even the Tsar of Russia, Alexander I, whom, whom you see here. It is said that all men let themselves be subjugated by this sweet, sweet and very attractive character. She excelled in music, in painting and even, even in gardening. But Hortense de Bournay, as we see, a, few, a very a physical, physical, very graceful woman, fit the canon of beauty of the day. And the, canon, the beauty of the canon of beauty of the day was modeled on the Greek, on the Greek models, uh, which along with the Roman model was, was then in vogue. She was slender with big blue eyes 
and the perfect complexion, and she was envied by just about every woman of the time. Her skin of porcelain was ideal for her, for her restrained impressions, as you can possibly see in the image. And uh, she also produced uh, two round, perfectly red spots on the young lady's cheek. Now, in the history books, Napoleon III, not, the, not Napoleon I, Napoleon III seemed to spring out of nowhere in the middle, in the middle of the 19th century. But he was actually, indeed, a blood nephew of Napoleon, being, as I said, the son of Napoleon's brother and of the beautiful Princess Hortense. Now, the same princess who, in the intricate, in the intricate development of 19th century history, became for a while, she became for a while even the Queen of Holland. Now, everyone, everyone knows of Napoleon I, of course, and many know of Napoleon III. Napoleon III, who re you may remember, ruled France for 20 years, from 1850 to until 1870, when the Prussians reached again the outskirts of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. But, you may say, or somebody may say, what about Napoleon II? It almost seems that history, that history skipped a beat, or rather, that, that history <laughs> skipped a Napoleon. To fill this gap, to fill this gap, let's open a brief parenthesis. There was indeed a Napoleon II, and here he is in this image. And as we have seen in his escape from Waterloo, I'm talking about um, Napoleon I, on his escape from Waterloo on reaching Paris, on reaching Paris, he stayed as we said, at the castle of Malmaison that belonged to the Josephine, to Josephine Bourne, his, his, first, his first wife, and again, as we said, mother of the beautiful Hortense. Napoleon, earlier on, de -divo divorced Josephine Bourne to marry Marie-Louise, Marie-Louise of Austria, who was, in turn, the eldest child of the Emperor of Austria, whose name was Francis I, and he belonged to the glorious, the glorious Habsburg family. And at the time when all this happens, the beginning of the 1800, at the beginning of the 1800, the Austrian Empire still was, or at least coincided, with the Holy Roman Empire, founded in the year 1800, actually, by Charlemagne. And talk about, we can say, talk about historical continuity. Anyway, Princess Marie-Louise, Marie-Louise of Austria, that is, grew up when revolutionary France and Imperial Austria were at each other's throat. But eventually, eventually the French army reached Vienna and Francis decided to dissolve the Roman Empire in, 18, in 1810. So the empire lasted, lasted exactly 10, 1,010 years. The end of that war with Napoleon also resulted in the marriage between Napoleon and uh, Napoleon I and Marie Louise of, Aus of Austria. Marie Louise was apparently, from what we can read in the history books, was an, a very obedient wife, and, and Napoleon loved her. And we can say that it was not a bad thing to do for a Corsican nobody to marry a member of one of the Europe's leading royal houses. It was Marie Louise who bore Napoleon a son, Napoleon II, Napoleon the, who at birth was given at birth was given the title of King of Rome, and later, after the debacle of Napoleon, became the Duke, the, the Duke of Reichstag, Reichstag, excuse me. But now let's return to Napoleon I in the castle of Malmaison near near Paris. While in the castle, rumor reached. Reach, reach, reach him and his entourage that the enemy, the British, were about, were about to enter or to reach Paris. In Paris, in turn, the provisional government was uncertain about what to do. A good portion of the army was still intact, uh, was actually operational, as we have seen in the previous sketch. And thanks to the, thanks to the partial, 
but nevertheless, good vic partial victory of of the Marquis de Grouchy, Marquis victory over the Prussians near Waterloo. But the provisional government decided to surrender, to surrender to the European to the European alliance, to the uh, to the coalition of the willing, as we call them today. There is no time here to lose for uh, at this point for to lose for Napoleon and his party, and rather than waiting for the visas for the United States, the next day, which is June the 30th, Napoleon's party will leave or decided to leave for the French for the French Atlantic coast. Now, the Rochefort was the place where they wanted to go. The small band armed themselves; they armed themselves as best that they could. And now, now. Some of you may ask, how was Napoleon sure that the United States would grant him a visa and let him come to the country? And here is one extra example of history's many twists. While England was engaged in fighting Napoleon in Europe, the Americans, the Americans thinking that England could not sustain a war on two fronts, had decided to annex Canada or rather, as we would say today, to bring to Canada freedom and democracy. And this, for you American watchers, was the War of 1812. This invasion of Canada failed because the Canadians, with the help of also of the Native Americans, the Indian, Native Indians, fought back. It was the war during which the English occupied and torched Washington in retaliation for the Americans having earlier on, torch put to fire the town of York, which is today's Toronto. And it was also, as you may recall, the war during which came about the birth of the American anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and so on and so on. But let's not go too far, let's not go too far from the theme of this sketch. Suffice to say that due to the War of 1812, the Americans again looked favorably at France and consequently they were likely to give a visa to Napoleon. Now we go back to the last moments before leaving Paris for good for Napoleon. Baron Gourgaud, whom I introduced in the previous sketch, took very good notes during this journey and he even says that before leaving he exchanged with a colleague a repeating rifle for a horse in exchange of a horse that he, Gourgaud, had captured during, during the Battle of Waterloo. And so Napoleon and his small band left, left, but not everyone. The cook did not leave. And why did the cook did refuse to go? Simple. Be he refused to go beca because he had not been paid for what he had not been paid, what was he, what he had been promised, pro promised while Napoleon was in exile in the island of Elba during the famous 100 days before, before the Battle of Waterloo. Now, for the trip from Paris to the coast, uh, Napoleon assumed a pseudonym. He called himself General, General Becker. However, even at the time without television, of course, Napoleon's features were well known. He had, he had become a kind of what we would today call an icon. And here and there, during his journey to the coast, he was recognized. He was recognized by the people. For example, at this town called Chateau Renault, uh, he was recognized uh, by the innkeeper where the where the small band had a dinner. But on the other hand, in the media, in the Im town immediately before before this one, the town of Vendôme, uh, there were people. Also, the citizens recognized Napoleon, but instead of shouting, Hail the Emperor, they shouted, Hail the King, which, which goes to show that we can, never, we can never be sure of what the popular feeling is or what it can be. And that is something that Shakespeare captured in the well-known lines from Henry VI, commanded always by the lightest, commanded always by the latest gust, such as the likeness of you common men. Now, when the group reached Poitiers, the town of Poitiers, they had a piece of discouraging news. At the coast, at the coast, 
the port of Rochefort was blockaded, blockaded by the British fleet. And here, and here, we can see the situation in front of the French coast. There were two French frigates, respectively the Meduse and the Salle, ready to pick Napoleon up and carry him to an American ship that happened to be there too. But the way out of the coast, though the canal passes by the Isle of Avelovex, was blockaded. In the British fleet, the most important ship was what was at the time called the Man of War by, and had the name of Bellerophon. And here is a bit, a bit of old naval warfare history and terminology. The Man of War that you see in this image was a British Royal Navy expression for the powerful warships in use might, um, primarily from the 16th to the 19th century. And the term man of war often refers to a ship armed with cannon and propelled primarily with sails as opposed to a galley which was propelled primarily by oars. The man of war ship was developed in England in the early 16th century from, and was a modification of earlier round ships with the addition of a fourth mast to form what was called at the time a carrack, a term derived from a Spanish term called carraca. It was the carraca who explored the world in the 15th and the, to, to, to the 18th century. And uh, in the 16th century, the carraca, or the Spanish carraca, evolved into the galleon and, to, and then into what was came to be called, as I said, a ship of the line. But why? Why did the British decide to call a galleon a man of war? And the term man of war for a ship makes no sense at all. Which man, one could say? And which, why one man and not many men? We cannot imagine a galleon where the crew is one man. And it does, as I said, it doesn't make any sense. Not only, but by long tradition, long tradition in the English language, which is also carried to the American, the names of ships are all feminine. We can call it a bit of a bit of lexical madness. The galleons were indeed stuffed by sailors who were, and by soldiers who were called men of war. And the men of war were actually heavily armed soldiers, and they were armed because during naval warfare uh, they occasionally had to physically go on the enemy ship and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, a ship full of armed men of war could be, would be called a man of war ship. But in the process of time, the word ship was discarded and found unnecessary, and so remained the phrase a man of war. Now, another term for a warship of older times was ship of the line, and which may prompt someone to say, but which line please, someone may ask. After an explanation, it makes some kind of sense. A ship of, it was called the ship of the line, defined the warship designed to take part in a naval tactic known as the line of battle, the line of battle. Two columns of opposing warship would maneuver to bring the greatest weight of lateral guns to bear. And these guns were decided for, designed for, for maximum power, for maximum power at short range. Now, these naval engagements were off almost invariable one by the heaviest ships carrying, carrying the, 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 the most powerful guns. And the natural progression was to build sailing vessels that were the largest and most powerful of their time. We could call them the jumbo ships of the line. Now, back to the HMS Bellerophon. And this Bellerophon was a third generation ship of the line of the Royal Navy but he was also a man of war. And if I have lost you completely, I do not assume responsibility. The fault is to be attributed to the curious vocabulary of the British Navy before the introduction of the steam engine and, and of modern naval warfare. Now, it just so happens that the Bellerophon was launched in 1786 and he carried 74 guns and served during the French Revolutionary Wars 
and the Napoleonic, Napoleonic Wars, mostly on blockades or, or uh, convoy, convoy ex ex escort duties. It fought during the Battle of Trafalgar. And uh, who was Bellerophon? Bellerophon was a Greek, a Greek mythological hero. It was he who killed the Chimera, a monster that had a lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. And the myth bequeathed to the English language the word, or, ad or rather the adjective, chimerical, that is, something that is wildly fanciful or, or imaginative. But the sailors on the Bellerophon, on the Bellerophon, if you like, were not expected as a whole to know much about Greek mythology, and among the sailors, the Bellerophon was known as Billy the Ruffian, or Billy Ruffian. Now, facing the powerful Bellerophon blockading the exit to the ocean were two French ships, as you can see here. They were actually frigates, and they were called, I think I mentioned before, the Meduse and the Sal. Now, in old naval terminology, what was the difference between a man of war and a frigate? Now, in the 18th century, the term referred to ships which were actually as long as a ship of the line or a man of war, but they were in, generally, in general square rigged, were faster than a man of war, and of, therefore carried lighter armament. They were used primarily for patrolling and escort. But in, in the definition, in the definition adopted by the British Admiralty, they were rated ships of at least 28 guns, carrying their principal armament upon a single continuous, continuous deck, the upper deck, while instead the ships of the line, like the Bellerophon we talked about, possessed two or more contiguous decks bearing each batteries, batteries of guns. Now back to Napoleon and to the need to take, to take decisions. And they are difficult decisions indeed to take in these cases because opinions and advice differ dramatically among the givers of opinion and the givers, and the givers of advice. Some officers who had just arrived at Rochefort suggested that Napoleon return not to Paris, but to the city, French city of Orléans, south of Paris, where the French army will fight, will fight under his command. On the other hand, the initial thought was, as we said, as was for Napoleon to go to America. And there was indeed an American ship in the bay near Rochefort. Maybe he could border at sea, uh, maybe eight, eight or ten miles from land, land that he could reach, perhaps he could reach this American ship with a good sailing boat. But that was easier said than done, considering the blockade, considering the tides, the winds, and etc. By the way, America and England were not friends at the time because of the War of 1812 that have just been included, as I mentioned before. Still, at Rochefort, the two French frigates, the Salle and the Meduse, are, were loaded and ready to accept Napoleon. The uh, English ship, the man of war, ready to confront them was the Bellerophon, as I said. And the captain, the captain of one of the French frigates, the Meduse, offered to fight single-handed the Bellerophon if the other French frigate, the Salle, would attempt to pass by with Napoleon on board. But of this plan, nothing came out of it, because that it was not only the Bellerophon, the man of war, but a number of other British ships all waiting, all waiting to chase, to chase and capture Napoleon. It is now July the 8th, 1815, and uh, Napoleon and a small, and a, along with a small party, embarks on a boat belonging to the port of Rocheport with, with ten rowers, it's actually a boat, a rowing boat. And in a rough sea, they reach, they reach the, the, uh, this French frigate. It was a stormy night, and uh, next morning, instead of proceeding on and passing in front of the fire of, of the Bellerophon, Napoleon landed on the Isle of X, which is a beautiful island, inspected the batteries and the fortifications, and remained there for a while, not knowing what to do. And now, 
as usual as possible, as understandable in this situation, confusion piles on confusion. And there are other plenty of suggestions. Now, there is the American ship in the vicinity, and there is also a vessel, a brig, a brig available to Napoleon to go on the ship. The brig was called, well, the name of the brig was actually called the Epervier, the Hulk. But maybe, uh, but this, this nothing came out of it because even the tides, even if the tides and the winds had been propitious, let alone the chances of escaping from the British fire, that would have been very, very difficult to, to, to get there. To add to the confusion and to the dilemma, there is also a Danish ship in the bay, and another group of advisors suggest that Napoleon escape to the Danish ship. In fact, at one point, the Danish option is chosen and all of Napoleon's effects are actually transferred to the Danish ship, less, unfortunately, Napoleon. Then another party suggests to, yet, to use yet another boat to reach the American ship. And the boat this time was called a lugger, or in French, a chasse literally meaning a chaser, a chaser of the tide. This small boat could only carry four people, along with Gaspar Gurgo, to whom we all owe all this information. And he would, maybe he would have gone, maybe he wouldn't. But even the idea of piercing the British blockade with the lugger or the chasse marais was anything but certain. And as Gurgo and Napoleon were debating what to do, a bird, a small bird, flew through the window. And remember that they were now on the island of X. And Gurgo said, it is an omen, it is an omen of good fortune. And Napoleon said, there are enough unhappy beings in this world to, so, so let, let's set it free, let's see, where this, let's see where this bird goes. And the bird went to the right in the direction of the Bellerophon, in the direction of the British, of the British ship. So, in the end, Napoleon sent a boat with the tricolor flag to the Bellerophon, and on the boat with the, there was, there was Mr. Las Casas, the other historian who went to St. Helena with Gurgo. Las Casas could speak English, but was told not to say that he did so to understood, to understand what the British were saying among themselves. Now we are getting, the time is getting, is getting close to the end, and I will stop here, we'll continue next time, and hopefully get with Napoleon to St. Helena. I will thank the crew, and particularly Kat Iverson, who directed the show. Thank you for watching, and until next time, this is Jimmy Molia for Historical Sketches. Good night.